So, first of all, when, welcome to everyone. This is the first spring seminar of the Statistics and Probability Seminar Series at the University of Nottingham. Today's speaker is Professor Peter Neal. Uh, Peter is a member of our group. Uh, Peter joined Nottingham uh, in, uh, in July and uh, his research interests span applied probability, statistical methodology and computational statistics. Peter's main research interest is mathematical modeling and statistical inference for infectious diseases. Uh, Peter, I want to thank you for starting this series of internal seminars, which uh, uh, we make available for people outside uh, the organization. Today, Peter uh, will talk about controlling an epidemic outbreak. When should we intervene? This is uh, a work in collaboration with another uh, well-known member of our group, Frank Ball. Uh, before we start, I ask to all the people to mute their microphone. And uh, Peter, the floor is yours. Oh, well, thank you very much, Fabrizio. Um, it's a pleasure to give, this, give a seminar. Um, it's also a bit of an unusual way to Give a, give a seminar. Um, when I joined the university, I doubted that my first, perhaps might call it inaugural lecture, would be would be via via Teams. So today, we're going to look at, at um, epidemic outbreaks and, in particular, what we can say um, about the distribution based on limited information. So to start off with, what's the motivation? Well, unsurprisingly, as with a lot of research in epidemic modeling at the moment, COVID-19. Um, so just to put everything I say sort of later on in context, um, I started working on the problem we're going to talk about back in the summer. And it was motivated by having three school aged children and then being out of out of school in the latter half of the last academic year and going back into school, thinking about um, when should schools close in terms of if you identify a case or two or three cases in a school, what does that tell you about the size of the outbreak there? Um, unfortunately, things have perhaps moved on since then and currently have three school aged children currently at home. So sort of more generally, if we observe cases of an infectious disease, the question is, should we intervene? Well, obviously there's a, yes and a no answer so yes we want to limit transmission we want to save lives on the other side of the coin it might be very expensive to intervene and actually a lot of out epidemic outbreaks die out very quickly so we don't want to take all the precautions if actually the epidemic would have already died out so what we can think about are what's the consequences of acting now or waiting, and whilst I won't touch on that, hopefully um, give some ideas about how we might sort of make some progress in answering the question. So the key thing I'm going to focus on is if we're going to decide whether to act now or wait when looking to control an epidemic, what's important is how many people are actually currently infectious. As I say, if we're, the motivation is perhaps something like a secondary school, we've got, a, say, approximately a thousand pupils, and we've just seen the first or the first few cases there. So we're wanting to say, what does the information we know about the outbreak, say, in that group, tell us about how many people are infectious? And the question I sort of started off with back in August, when I had a, had a spare day to play around with some math, was saying, OK, we observe the first case of a disease, and then we observe a second case sometime later. How much information does the time between the, us observing the first case and us observing the second case tell us about the size of, size of the epidemic? So as I say, we'll come back to that question a little bit later. So continuing on with the theme of intervention or looking at the population size, one thing which has certainly got a lot of pub publicity over the last year is reproduction numbers. And the simplest one to, to describe and 
the one which I think in many ways is, is probably the most informative, is the basic reproduction number, R0. And this can simply be defined as the expected number of secondary cases generated by an infective in a susceptible population. And sort of the simple idea here is if R0 is greater than one, so on average, each person is infecting more than one other person, then there is a non-zero probability of a major epidemic. So one which takes off and affects a sizable proportion of our population. So if we're sticking again with say a school, that might be, you know, we might say major if it affects over 200 people in a school of, of size of 1000, for example. But we can have, as is often the case, quite a few people who don't infect anybody else. So even though R0 might be quite high on average, a lot of people can infect a lot of people, we still might very well have the very real possibility that the first case we see is somebody who doesn't pass the disease on. So we can ask what is the probability of a major epidemic? And this will depend upon various um, properties of the epidemic process. But what we can do is look at a fairly simple model, the general stochastic epidemic model, which I'll describe shortly. Um, it's not particularly general, it's a, it's a rather simple Markovian model. But what we have in that case is the probability of a major outbreak is one minus one divided by R0. So here we're assuming R0 is greater than one. If R0 is less than one, then the epidemic will almost surely be small. But what we can see here is that the probability of a major out outbreak is R0 minus one divided by R0. So if R0 is greater than one, but not much larger than one, then actually the chance of a major outbreak is pretty small. And even if we take R0 equals two, even then the chance of a major outbreak is only 50%. So if we've just seen one case of in the disease outbreak and R0 we believe to be say 1.2 or 1.3, then we probably don't want to introduce control measures at that point if control measures are expensive. But once we've seen obviously quite a few cases, we don't want to see a ma major outbreak, which would be damaging not only for, say, a school, but also lead to considerable further infection, perhaps within the community. So let's have a look at what information does the epidemic provide. So for the general stochastic epidemic model, GSE, what we have is a Markovian SIR epidemic. So we have susceptible individuals, which for COVID-19, all of us start off in that state. At some point in time, if we get contacted by somebody with the disease, we can very likely become infected and infectious. We're then infectious for a certain period of time before we're removed. And that might represent quarantining, we show symptoms and are isolating, might be hospitalization, extreme cases, death, or it might be for asymptomatic individuals, just carry on as usual. And then after some time, we're no longer infectious with the disease. So the Markovian part of the model just really states that we have that individuals have independent, identically distributed infectious periods which are each exponentially distributed with some parameter gamma. And assumption we make is that whilst infectious, we're making constant in infection. So we have a constant rate of, of contact with individuals at rate alpha. And if we're infectious, we make contact with somebody and they're susceptible, we pass the disease onto them. So what we can do with the GSE, as I say, it's a Markovian model, is all we need to know at any point in time is how many susceptible individuals we have and how many infected individuals. I should say that we're making an assumption here that the population is closed, so no births and deaths. And again, if our motivation is 
the early stages of an epidemic well, outbreak. <laughs> Fenty? Sorry, can I just ask you to mute you the microphone? Sorry, Peter. Ah, no worries. It's very, it's very, it's very easily done to, to uh, unmute. Um, so what we have is we have. The key thing is if we know how many susceptibles we have and how many infected we have at any point in time, then the future dynamics of the epidemic only depend upon the number of susceptibles and infected individuals we have now. So what we can do is write down the transition probabilities from moving from S susceptibles to I infected. So what can happen is either a susceptible becomes infected and our susceptibles decrease by one and our infected increase by one. And this is given by alpha times S times I. So the number of pairs of contacts between susceptibles and infectives divided by N, the overall population size. So this is taking into account that as essentially our population gets bigger, the number of contacts we make doesn't change. Our chance of contacting any particular individual, though, does decrease. And the rate at which infectives are um, recovering or being removed from the population is just I times gamma. So what we can do is look more into the infection rate, given we have S susceptibles and I infected. And in particular, if we're looking at an outbreak, as I say, in somewhere like a school, which hasn't seen any cases before, perhaps has only seen a few, then what we can do is just put, approximate the number of susceptibles by n, the total population size. So what we can then do is replace s by n in our equation, and we just have that the probability of an infection then just becomes, in a small interval of time, h just becomes alpha, the contact rate of an individual, times i, the number of infected, times h, the small time interval. So what we're we doing here, well, we're making an approximation that all contacts made by an infectious individual is with a susceptible and are then hence successful. And we can think of this as being births of individuals. So the next thing I do is introduce an approximating birth death process. And so moving forward, I will use fairly interchangeably the idea of birth and infection. We're creating new individuals, in this case, infected. And death here just means a removal of an infectious individual. And that, as I say, might be in extreme cases, death, but more generally, recovery and immunity to further infection. So by replacing S by N for the infection rate, all we need to do then is essentially keep track of the number of infected or effective in infectious individuals we've got in our population. So what we can do is just mimic the number of infected by a linear birth death process. So where we just keep track of the number of births and we can see that we have here the probability that we'll have a new birth in a small interval to be I times alpha times H and the probability that we'll have a death in a small time interval will be I times gamma times H. So the linearity here comes from the fact that our birth rate and death rate are just linear in the number of individuals that we've got in the population. So just sticking with that, what we can notice and is going to be rather useful as we move forward is if we look at what our next event will be, then the probability that the next event will be a birth will just be P given by the birth rate alpha, the infection rate, divided by the, if you like, the event rate, which is just the birth rate plus the death rate, so alpha plus gamma. And this will hold as long as we have at least somebody alive in the population. Obviously, once we reach nobody alive, 
there's nobody to die and there's nobody to give birth to new individuals. And similarly, we can just define the death probability of event, Q is just being one minus the birth, the birth probability. And because it's in all the results we've been talking about, it's really the ratio of alpha to gamma, which is important. What I'm just going to do is set gamma equal to one. We will move on from this um, right towards the end, where we talk about the situation where the birth and death rates can, can be time, time varying. But setting gamma equals to one just says that what we're doing is setting one unit of time to be equivalent to the mean infectious period. So we can perhaps think about that as being a week. In, in the context of COVID, that might give us a sort of reasonable starting place to think about. OK, so we've described the motivation and the epidemic process. But what information is typically available from an epidemic outbreak? So in terms of what we might want to observe, we might want to observe both when individuals become infectious and when they no longer are infectious, when they become removed. Well, typically, we don't have any information about when individuals are born or become infected. But what we do have is often some information about removals, i.e. deaths. We might, for example, with COVID, know when people have gone to have a test and been confirmed as a case. And we might at that point um, assume that they no longer take part in spreading COVID amongst the population. We assume that they then isolate and no longer contrib contribute infection. So what can we do if we just observe the removal, i.e. the death process? What can we say about, about the size of the epidemic? And as I say, this was very much the original sort of motivation. What about, what can we say about the population size, given we say observed three or four infections, and we know what's the time between the different individuals showing symptoms. So the place where I want to sort of start in sort of looking at the population size is to see what we can say about the size of the population at the case death. And I'm going to start off by looking at a situation where we don't know the times of the deaths. We don't know the removal times. And again, whilst we will move on to looking at the situation where we've got times of death, there were quite plenty of situations where that information might not be, be available and or we might not take it to be reliable. And so we can just use the fact that we've observed K individuals have shown symptoms of the disease. What can that tell us about the population size? Now, the first thing we can note is the number of births between each death just follows a geometric distribution and geometric with parameter Q. And I'm going to allow my geometric to start from zero. So I can have zero births. So that would correspond to my first event being a death. Or we could have X number of births and we have X births in a row with probability P to the X, as we've seen already, our probability that an event is a birth is just P, no matter how many people we've got alive. And why that's useful is we can, first of all, find X1, so the number of people alive immediately after the first death, and that will just follow a geometric distribution. So we'll have our initial individual, and that will give us one. And then we'll have a geometric number of births before we have a death. And that, so that will take one away from our pop population size. More generally, if we are in a situation where we've got xk minus one greater than zero. So after we've observed the k minus first death, there are still infectious individuals 
in the population, still people alive. Then the number alive at the kth death will just be how many we started with after the k minus first. We'll have a geometric number of births take place. And then obviously we have one death to finish things off. So we can easily write down a recursive relationship expressing the population size following the case death in terms of the population size at the k minus first death, and we could iterate that back. But a key point here is this will be the case if the population hasn't gone extinct, i.e. the disease hasn't died out after the k minus first death. So for us to get to k deaths, what we require is at least k minus one births. We have the initial individual, and then we need k minus one additional births to get to a population size of k, or I should say k people ever alive, because during that process, some will die and some will be born. So what we can do is just look at the early stages of our process until either we reach k individuals have ever ever been alive, i.e. we've seen k minus one births, or the alternative is the process has gone extinct. So we've not managed to reach k minus, sorry, k minus one births because we've observed more deaths and the population has just died out. And we can then just construct a Markov chain and Markov chain with states AD, where A just denotes the total number of people ever alive and D just denotes the total number of deaths. And what we can then do is easily create a transition matrix for this Markov chain. So if we're in state AD, so what we'll have at that point is D people have died, and A minus D people will currently be alive in the population. And then we can have a birth. So our number ever alive increases by one to A plus one. And this will occur with probability P. Or we can, or we can have a death and we'll move to the state A D plus one. And this will occur with probability Q. And to make it clearer, we, what we can do is look at an example. So I'm just going to look at the case where k equals three. So in this case, we have seven states. We're, going to, we're always going to start off from the state one, zero, one person alive who's not yet died. And then we're going to transition through the states until either the number alive equals the number dead. So these are denoted in red, one, one, and two, two. And these are situations where the epidemic, our approximating birth death process, has died out before we've ever reached three people ever alive in the population. The states in black, one, zero, two, zero, and two, one, are transient states. So those are ones we're moving, we're moving through. We haven't got to one of our end states, and we can proceed either with a birth or a death from these states. And finally, we have the blue states, 3, 0 and 3, 1. So these are the states which we arrive at where we've had three individuals now alive in the population. The first, we arrive at three individuals before we've seen any deaths. And the second case where we observe that the third individual comes alive after, the, after a death has occurred. Note that we can't have the state 3, 2 here, because to get to the state 3, 2, you can only get to that from the state 3, 1. You can't go have a birth if you've already died out, so you can't get to that from 2, 2. So what we've done here is written down a simple transition matrix corresponding to moving through these states. And so it's then easy to work out what's the probability that you end up in each of the four possible end states here. So 
and in particular whether you manage to get to three people ever alive. So the number of possible paths, so, so if we let VK just denote our absorbing state, so the probability that we get absorbed into a state which sees K people ever alive. So if we look at the case KD, so we've seen D deaths, and k people alive, then any path which gets to this state must have seen k minus one births, and each birth has probability p. We must have seen d deaths, so each of these has probability q. And the number of ways that we can get to, to that is given by this constant c k minus one d. Um, so this is just Catalan number, and Catalan numbers crop up a number of places in probability. And one of the sort of prime examples is the ballot problem. So we've got a similar sort of situation here. For us to get to K minus, we've got K minus one births and D deaths. And what we want to do is avoid at any point having more deaths than we have births. So if we got to that situation, then the epidemic has gone extinct. So we reach our state KD, so we can go back to our example with K equals three and D equals one, for example. So we, what we have in that situation is we have only, we've seen one death by the time we've seen three people alive. So what we have up until the third death is G1 plus G2, additional births take place. Well, what we can do is think about the number of births of an individual. So that will take us up to the second death. And then we can think about how many births the third individual has up to the third, third death. So in that way, if we're in state KD, when we reach K people ever alive, then the number of additional births until the D de death D will just be a sum of K minus D geometrics. So negative binomial with parameters K minus D and Q. And so what we could do is just express XK as a mixture of negative binomials. And our negative binomials, QJ, will have the, like, the success parameter, or the number of successes that we want, J going from two up to, up to K. And we can easily write down what is the mixing probabilities for this mixture of binomials. But I'm actually not too bothered what the specifics are. But just the fact that we've got this mixture of negative binomials and what we can then do is look and see what happens when we introduce the death times. So how do things change if we actually observe the, the time, times of death? So in particular, what I'm going to do is focus on the inter-arrival times. How long is it between each, each death occurring? So I'm just going to take TK to be the time from the K minus first death to the Kth death. So we'll look at T2, T3, and so on. Obviously, we don't know how long typically the disease has been in the population prior to the first death. And just for completeness, if we never see k deaths, then we just take tk to be equal to infinity. And just a bit further notation. So now, as we're tracking how the epidemic or the linear birth death process proceeds over time, we can just look at the population size at any point in time, yt, and just take our time zero to be the time at which the first death is observed. So y naught will just be equal to x1, population size immediately after the first death, which will just be geometric with parameter q. So what we're going to look at is what's the distribution of yt, given the death times k of which up to time t, and also 
what's the population size immediately following the case death, given again the interarrival times of the deaths. So we'll, fo we'll focus on both of these. And what can we say? So what we're actually going to look at is what happens up until the second death? Because if we understand actually what happens between the first or the time of the first death and the time of the second death, then that pretty much tells us the whole dynamics beyond that. So we can actually use these as the key building blocks. So I'm going to consider a sometime tau. Tau is just B positive. And we'll look at the case where the second death does not occur until sometime after tau. And we'll look at the case then at T2 equals tau. So we know when the second death occurs. So to do this, I'm just going to start with looking at what happens if we have a single individual in the population at time zero. So what we can do is look forward to tau units of time, and I'm just going to let Z tau denote the population size at time tau. As I said, our starting point is to look at the case where we, we observe no deaths in the interval from zero to tau. So I'm just going to let E tau just be the event that no deaths occur by time tau. And more generally, are you just use E for an event which assumes no deaths take place in a particular interval. I'm just going to define phi of t just to be e to the minus alpha plus one times t. And this is just the probability that an individual who's alive for t units of time does nothing in that time. So they don't die and they don't give birth or don't infect anybody else. Then what we have is that z tau is just one, so that's our initial individual, plus a geometric. And that geometric just depends upon the birth rate, P, the death rate, Q, and phi of tau. So this probability of doing nothing. But what it can be is quite instructive to have a look at how this comes about. So what we can do is start with our initial individual. And our initial individual starts its life at time zero, or it might have started its life before then, but it's still alive at time tau. What we can then do is look back from time tau and see when the first individual, its first offspring occurred. So this red circle denotes the first offspring. And we can then look forward on that individual and see whether they survive to time tau or not. So all being well, they survived to time tau. What I'm now going to do is start with the child, and I'm going to work back from time tau and look to see if they've given birth to anybody. In this example, we work back a little way, and we can see that they give birth to somebody. And then again, we will check that their, ch their child survives to time tau. So, we now have three individuals and they're all still alive at time tau. So now we can work back and see if the third individual has any children. They don't. So what we do is then move on to their parent and we look at the remaining period of their lifetime. They now have no offspring. And so we go back to our original individual and find that they have an offspring, another offspring further back in time. So again, we then check to make sure that this individual's lifetime survives to a time tau. So what we've done by this construction is at this point, we've got four individuals alive. And the red lines show the areas that we've exposed that we've looked at for possible births, and the black lines show unexplored lifetime going back from going from tau back to zero. Now the probability that we'll have another birth is just the same as in the original situation. We've still got tau units of time to expose going from tau to zero. 
So hopefully that gives some motivation for why we're seeing the geometric. We've got a memoryless property coming in. And for this particular example, I assume that we have no more births. So we have a situation where we have four individuals emerging from, sorry, four individuals emerging by time tau from our original infective. So this has come about by looking at the probability our in initial individual survives. That's just e to the minus tau. The probability that they have no offspring in an interval will just be e to the minus alpha for, for tau. We've just got an interval of length tau and reproduction rate alpha. And what we've also been interested in is what's the probability of having at least one offspring and that offspring surviving to time tau, which again is easy enough to write down. And then that's easy to write down the joint probability of z tau equals n, and we haven't yet gone extinct. In other words, we've not yet seen somebody die. But a key point here is what we already know is that at time zero, at the time of the first death, we have not one individual, but a geometric number of individuals. And remember that geometric could be zero. So what we can do is extend this argument on and look rather than at one individual, we can look at a geometrically distributed number of individuals. And the important point here is that a nice property of the linear birth death process is its process where each individual's um, lifetimes and ancestors behave independ independently. So we can just look at a, gym, a random number of sequences as we did before. And in particular, what we can show is that if we started off with a geometric number of individuals, then our distribution at time tau, given we've not yet seen a, seen a death, is a mixture distribution. And it's a mixture of this same geometric G with probability H of tau. And that's just given by the probability that if you start with one individual, you have no deaths by time tau and a point mass at zero with probability one minus h of tau. It should be pointed out as tau increases, h of tau is decreasing. So the longer we've waited since the first death, the less likely it is that the epidemic is continuing. So the greater the probability, we have nobody left alive. OK, so that give, allows us to describe what happens to our estimate of the population size, given we've not yet seen the second death. So what can we say if we observe the second death at time T2? So what we can note is that X2 is just Y of T2. So that's just the size of the population at a time TU2 units after, after the first death. And what we've already just seen is we can describe uh, the distribution of how many people are alive on the interval from zero to just before T2. So from this, it's fairly straightforward to actually get the distribution at the second death. Just before we do that, um, one thing we, we can show is the time T2 is in fact a mixture distribution. It could be, it's equal to infinity with probability Q. That just corresponds to the first event in our birth death process, our epidemic process, just being a death or removal. If that occurs, nothing else can happen and the populations die down. The other case is that the first event is a, is a birth, and in that case, the time until the next death we find is just exponential, and the rate is just alpha plus one, a rate that an individual has an event. 
So it's then very easy to work out both the survival function, i.e. we've not seen a death yet, and the PDF for T2. So what we have is we can look at the population just before the second death occurs. So if we want X individuals alive immediately after the second death, then just before that occurs, we need X plus one individuals alive. So the probability that X2 equals X given T2 equals T little t2, it's just the limit as tau tends to t2, that just before that time, we have x plus one individuals alive. And we can break this down essentially into three parts. Probability that we've not yet seen a death by tau, the prob conditional probability that x plus one individuals are alive, and then the probability density for observing a death in a small interval of time given we've got x plus one individuals alive. So we can just jot this down. And what we can see is the terms which involve time actually just disappear from equation. And what we're left with is that this probability is independent of T2. No, we are assuming here that T2 is, is finite, that we do see a second death. Then our probability is just x plus one times p to the x times q squared. And as we probably all know, at least if we think about it, this is just actually a negative binomial with parameters 2 and q. So what we saw when we looked at the situation with no deaths, so when we didn't know the death times, then the population size x2 was again just given by a negative binomial 2q. And we see that crop up again here. So just being mindful of time and things, what we can then do is fairly easy, construct the process going forward. In particular, what we can do is actually represent X rather than XK is the population in terms of quantity RK, which just denotes a number of geometric random variables. So because we've seen that XK is a mixture of negative, negative binomials, if we look at the case with no, where the death times are not observed, when we do observe the death times, we can again write it down as a mixture of negative binomials. And in particular, with the situation R1 equals one and R2 equals two. And then moving forward from that, what we can do is show that if we know what that RK is equal to J, so that we know, if you like, what is the appropriate negative binomial distribution, then at the K plus first death, we can see that RK plus one is distributed to plus a binomial J minus one. So how does that come about? That comes about if we think about having J um, lifelines, it, each one attached to each of the geometrics, then if we go back to what we had before, if we see a death, we see a death on one of these, these lines, and we know that when a death occurs, we go from having one geometric to the sum of two geometrics, so one becomes two. For the other J minus one lines, what we can have, because we've got this mixture between a geometric and a point mass at zero, is we can think of the lifelines either following that geometric or being a point mass at zero. So what we can do is, is quantify this, and we can also do a similar thing if we're just looking at the full process YT. And we can give then the representation in matrix form for actually what is the mixture probability based upon the death times. Okay, so 
in the last couple of minutes or so, just want to summarise what we've seen so far and then talk about um, extensions of the work and in particular what we can say or what might be useful for control measures. So what we've had is that population at the time s given k deaths can be actually expressed as a mixture of k plus one negative binomials. So the negative binomial zero q is just zero. But it's useful to think about it as a negative binomial and we can then have negative binomials from one to k. The mixture weights are determined by the death times and as we mentioned earlier, if you don't observe the death times, you can still get this mixture of negative binomials. And if the case death is at time s, then the weights are on the two smallest negative binomials, so zero and one is equal to zero. So what we have is a lower bound for the size of the population at any death after the first death being a negative binomial 2q. But as I mentioned at the start, what can be of interest is what if we allow our parameters to be time varying? So that could represent you know, the introduction of control measures. We take action to reduce alpha or possibly, though not strictly in line with the model, what about if we have a new variant of the disease and perhaps alpha becomes higher? So what's important is, again, alpha t and gamma t, is we can again express a probability pt of a birth at time t. So if an event occurs at some point in time, we can say how likely it is to be a birth. And we can then set up a sort of average birth probability which is just given by solving the ODE given. So that basically says our uh, average birth probability changes. It depends upon its current value, P tilde T. It depends upon the current birth probability. And the rate of change is just the rate at which events are occurring. So if alpha and gamma are large, so things are happening quickly, then this probability changes rapidly. And similarly, we can just define Q tilde T and QT just as being one minus the birth probabilities. So in the time varying case, what we can just do is say the population size at time S actually follows all the same rules as we saw before. So all we have now is rather than a constant Q for our bino negative binomials, this will now depend upon time t. So just the very final thing is to look at the what happens perhaps if we have control measures. So I'm going to look at a situation where alpha equals 1.5, that corresponds to the birth probability of 0.6. And at some point in time, we can introduce control measures, which reduces alpha to 0.5. Or P, equivalent P, equals a third. What I'm just going to do is introduce control measures when the mean number of individuals exceeds three. And I'm going to remove control measures when the mean number of individuals falls below two. So I simulated this example. So the red line just denotes the actual population size at different points in time. We can see we have a maximum number of five people infected and the epidemic dies out just before time six. We can then plot the expected number and so we can see this as a black dashed line and we can see jumps occur whenever a death occurs. So when the actual population size drops down, we see a jump in our expected number. And as I say, this has been a case where we've introduced control measures. So the shaded lines just show 
the times in, in which control measures have been implemented. So this is, as I say, just for illustrative purposes, but it gives us an idea with this particular regime, what we see is a lot of sort of flicking in and out of control measures. And in particular, after the, the third death onwards, when we see a death, that pushes our, our expected number above three and control measures, if they're not already implemented, are implemented. And we can also look and see how our average birth probability sort of varies over time. It starts off at 0.6, and then as we go in and out of control measures, it's jumping up and down. And then after about time 6.2, we know the epidemic has already died out. We can see that it then increases up to, point, up to 0.6 again. But obviously at that point, there's nobody left infectious in in the population. OK, so just some final remarks. So the proofs do rely very much on the SIR dynamics and is one of the results which doesn't which won't easily extend to introducing, say, a latent latent period. Um, extending these results beyond the Markovian case is non is non trivial, but we can make some progress. In particular, we can show that the first death, the number alive, follows a geometric distribution for any general infectious period, and our parameter for our geometric is just the probability of no having no offspring, so an individual having no offspring. We can make progress. If rather than having the Markovian model, if we just assume a fixed length infectious period, we can then again show that the number alive after each death follows a negative binomial or a mixture of negative binomials going from now one to K. And our probability of having no offspring in this case is just given by E to the minus alpha. Sort of a question sort of moving forward is perhaps how do we evaluate control measures? So the example I gave, we what we did was did something very simple. We just looked at the mean number of infectives and we had a scheme which was going rapidly on and off. Obviously, that might not be very desirable. It might very well be, be costly. And if I'm thinking again in terms of schools, it can be very disruptive if you if you open the school one day, close it the next, open it again. So we might very well want to put in a cost each time we introduce control measures. But as I say, the main motivation was, was thinking about, well, what could we say about the population size given the removal times? So thank you very much for your attention. Um, very happy to take any questions. So Peter, I wanted just to ask you um, to clarify um, in, your con in the conclusion, you were talking about the control measures. Uh, yeah. So what are exactly the, the questions that you, you would like to, to answer in the future? Um, I think I think there's a no number of things that we we could we could look to look to answer. As I say, what I've, I've tended to focus on is um, Saying given given the death times, how, how many people are, are are infectious? So what I'd be certainly interested in is to what extent do these actually sort of link in with with real with real with real control measures, or 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 how how do we need to to adapt things? So I've I've just focused on on the mean number of infectives. I think that's probably a good a, a good guide. You could look at other aspects, you know. Um, what is the probability of a, of a major epidemic? Because if you know the probability distribution, you can just say, well, what's essentially what's the probability it's, yeah. it's going to take off? Um, th this may give you sort of slightly di different um, answers. Um, also, um, one sort of key assumption here is, you know, the Markovian 
model. Um, you know, certainly interested in what happens if 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 we replace that with a more general infectious yeah. period. Um, 